because it's the 75th anniversary of the NHS and Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer are over the road at a service of remembrance uh, or a service of celebration, no, prayers for, by the way, uh, the NHS. Uh, whose anniversary is today. You'll have seen the interview with Steve Barkley, the health secretary, running on Sky News uh, with Beth Rigby uh, to mark that occasion. Now, I think there are going to be tributes to the NHS from both players, uh, but I think the main meet of today, certainly as far as Angela Rayner is concerned, is likely to be on mortgages. In fact, in the last uh, hour or so, we've had some uh, troubling news about the state of the economy. Britain's The cost of Britain's debt, the cost of government debt, the amount of money that you have to pay to buy government debt, which is a reflection of uh, inflation and, and risk, uh, that's gone up to the highest rate since 1999. So uh, it, more than 20 years ago was the last time you had to pay uh, the amount to buy government debt at this rate. And I think and, and, and that will uh, we will see that feeding through into interest rate rises, uh, into higher mortgage costs. We've got some five-year fixed rate mortgages now on uh, on over six uh, percent. Uh, so people who have mortgage debt, when it comes up for renewal, and a real strain, and that I think is what Angela Rayner wants to concentrate after some tributes to the NHS. Let's listen in. On the fifth of July, we start together the new national health service. It is not had an altogether trouble-free gestation. There have been understandable anxieties inevitable in so great and novel an undertaking. But the sooner we start, the sooner we can try together to see these things and to secure the improvements we all want. It is fair to say that 75 years later, the NHS still faces challenge, but it is right today that we celebrate an institution which treats over a million people a day. In particular, I'm sure members across the House want to join me in celebrating the staff of the NHS, past, present and across all our constituencies. To them, I say, on behalf, on behalf of the House, thank you for your outstanding contribution to he the health and well-being of us all. And of, course, and, of course, the National Health Service Act is a reminder of the vital role of this House in creating debating legislation as part of a democratic process. So I say to previous MPs, thank you for what you did. We will not forget. Yeah. Let us now start with Prime Minister's questions. Yeah. Stephen Metcalf. Yeah. Uh, number one, Mr Speaker. Ah, oh, Deputy <laughs> Prime Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, Mr Speaker, I have been asked to reply on behalf of my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, who is actually attending a service right now in Westminster Abbey to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the NHS. And, Mr Speaker, may I associate myself with your comments? The NHS continues to be a treasured national institution, and I'm sure colleagues across the House in this session will join you in celebrating its values, its achievements, and in thanking staff for their huge commitment to patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I too associate myself with the remarks you made celebrating the 75th anniversary of the NHS and on behalf of my constituents and all our constituents, thank them for the work they do day in yeah. and day yeah. out. Yeah. Um, last Friday, Mr Speaker, I met with a group of residents who have raised a petition to keep the last bank in Corringham Town open. The viability of our town centres is often dependent on the presence of a small number of anchor businesses such as a post office or a bank. Can my right honourable friend therefore tell the House what action the Government can take to ensure that at least one of these maintains a high street presence to support businesses and residents alike, particularly yeah. when these organisations have received significant government support. Yeah. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise this issue. Banks are a cornerstone of our high streets. Of course, it's ultimately a commercial decision for banks, but I do think it's right that they take into account 
the views of local communities, and I'm sure the bank in question will have heard the remarks to the House from my honourable friend, and I trust that they will take appropriate action. I now come to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Angela Rayner. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I associate myself and thank you for your opening comments regarding our NHS and thank all of those staff that have worked and continue to work in our NHS today. And I'm sure members across the whole House will join me in paying tribute to Lord Bob Kerslake, a decent and kind man who accomplished so much in both local and national government during a lifetime of public service. Our heartfelt condolences go to his family. Mr Speaker, I'm glad to see the right honourable gentleman here today. I think I'm right in saying that I have the pleasure again next week, two weeks on the trot. They really have given up. Every day, every day, 4,000 families' mortgages deals expire, 100,000 more since we last met, and millions more next year. Families are sick with worry about the cost of the Tory mortgage bombshell. Do they still claim to be the party of home ownership? Well, may I begin by associating myself with the Right Honourable Lady's remarks about Lord Bob Kerslake. I knew him from my time in Downing Street. He was a stalwart public servant and he will be missed by by many on both sides of this House. Uh, It may come as a surprise to the Right Honourable Lady, but actually some leaders trust their deputies to stand in for them. (laughs) When it comes to mortgage rates, I support the independence of the Bank of England taking the necessary measures to control inflation. Just ask the IMF about what we have done in support of them. They have said we have taken decisive and responsible action to bring down inflation, and we will continue to do so. But what is Labour's plan? To borrow £28 billion a year pushing up inflation, to cut our domestic energy supply, pushing up inflation, and to penalise workers saving into their pensions, pushing up inflation. There we have it from Labour, endless borrowing and higher prices. Angela Rayner. Mr Speaker, we've had 13 years of Conservative failures, and that ho- homeowners watching that pathetic answer will be cringing that they aren't celebrating the government's success, they're counting the cost of their failures, and the only thing that's not soaring in prices at the moment is these gags that are getting cheaper by the minute. And Mr Speaker, it's not just homeowners that are suffering. Security of renters have been ripped away too, with higher mortgage costs handed directly to them. Given most renters live in homes with buy-to-let mortgage, can he tell us, are buy-to-let properties included in their mortgage support package, yes or no? Well, it's actually the case that under this government, and thanks to my right honourable friend, the the Secretary of State for levelling up, that we have introduced legislation for the first time to support support renters, to give them greater security of tenure, and of course the Chancellor will take all necessary measures to stand behind both mortgage holders and of course take necessary measures for renters. But look, we we have a, a choice in this country, and the choice that we have made is to invest in our economy, giving us the fastest growing economy in the G7 for the past two years, creating jobs with record low unemployment and increasing people's wages by by providing the national living wage £1,600 into everyone's pockets. That's how this government is supporting people. Angela Rayner. Mr Speaker, I know the Deputy to our Minister isn't very good on facts, but their party did crash the economy. And he will know that, according to his own government's data, over two million buy-to-let properties are missing out on support. Yeah. No fault evictions are up by 116 per cent this year. So will he tell us if the Prime Minister has a spine now to stand up to the vested interests in his own party and finally deliver their promise to ban no fault evictions? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, uh, I don't think the Prime Minister is going to take any lectures on weakness from the party opposite. I, re I remember that there's a lot of talk about reshuffle in the air from the, the Labour Party. The last time the leader of the Labour Party tried to sack the Right Honourable Lady, she walked out with a promotion. <laughs> but we will continue to stand behind renters and to support them. And my right honourable friend will take all necessary steps. Angela Rayner. Mr Speaker, that, that, that answer is pathetic for all those people that are facing homelessness on his watch. We will ban no-fault evictions, Mr Speaker, unlike the party opposite. And Jessica and her four children from Plymouth were evict evicted from their home in April. They are temporarily living with Jessica's mother in a cramped house where her two eldest children are sleeping on blow-up beds in the front room surrounded by their belongings. Hardly the decent, secure life that his government promised. Don't families like Jessica deserve better? Yes. 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 Deputy Prime Minister. I'll tell you what we're doing for families like Jessica's. We are increasing the national living wage. It was this party that introduced the national living wage, not the party opposite. It is this party that has doubled, doubled the personal allowance cutting taxes for those people, and it is this party that has lifted a million people out of unemployment. I am immensely proud of the record of this government, and that is why people will not trust the party opposite to crash the economy again. Mr. Spe Mr Speaker, I asked a question about no-fault evictions. I was very clear on what the Labour Party would do, but I can't see us getting through a single one of these encounters without the Deputy Prime Minister blaming the opposition for his government's own record. When asked yesterday about the record low number of council houses being built, the Housing Minister says she didn't recognise that statistic. When asked about support for people in temporary accommodation, she said it wasn't her brief, the brief of the Housing Minister. So if council housing isn't her responsibility, whose is it? Well, the, the party opposite may have failed to notice it's actually under this government that more council houses were built than when they were un, in office. It's, it's actually under this party that we have record levels of housing being built. We stand very proudly on the record of this government. But, but look at what we have done more broadly. Inflation and waiting lists coming down, growth forecasts up, Albanian crossings down. Well, we're delivering on our priorities. What have we seen from the party opposite? They've U-turned five times in the last month already. The record is clear. The only thing you can rely on the party opposite to deliver is broken promises. Mr Speaker, talking about broken promises, house building is set to collapse to its lowest level since the war. Yeah. Rents and mortgages are soaring. Home ownership is plummeting and over a million people are trapped waiting for a council house. There is one simple solution to this problem and everyone knows it. Yeah. So when will he finally stand up for the national interest instead of their own interests and build more houses? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. I say to the right honourable lady, she may, she may not have listened to the answer I gave and just moved straight on to the next pre-scripted question. We have, got, we have built more houses under this government than the party opposite. And I'm afraid it's the same old thing from her. She stacks up the endless job titles, she takes the union cash and she constantly talks Britain down. That's why we will do everything we can to keep Labour out of people's pockets, out of their lives and out of government. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I might respectfully say to the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, if she wants to know what we're doing on rental reform, she can look at the rental reform bill that this government is introducing. But, but on a sec... Is that your question? 
Speaker. Well, well I think you ought to ask your question. My question, Mr. Mr Speaker, is about the Slapton line in my constituency. Can it be right that Natural England is holding back major infrastructure development in South Devon and not allowing us to keep key infrastructure being developed? Well, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right to speak up for the Slapton line. It's one of the most beautiful roads in the country. I, I understand that the Slapton line partnership, which includes Natural England and the Environment Agency, are working closely with the local community on their plans. We now come to the Deputy Leader of the SNP, Murray Black. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would also like to begin by thanking all of the staff in our health services across these aisles. And as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the health services in the UK, I want to reflect on two quotes from two people. The first one is, it's, something, it's about using the private sector more, something we should be very comfortable with. The second quote is, people go as NHS patients to the private sector and we could do more of it. Can I ask the Deputy Prime Minister which quote is from the PM and which is from the Leader of the Opposition? <laughs> well, uh, Mr Speaker, may I actually just begin by saying genuinely how sorry I was to hear that the Honourable Lady will be standing down at the next election. She and I joined this House at the same time and I know she has contributed much to her party and to this place. And may I also say I'm sure she will wish to join me in celebrating His Majesty King Charles receiving the Scottish regalia I think pretty much as we speak. There's, there's always time for a Damascan conversion, Mr Speaker. But when, when, when it comes to the NHS, I will take absolutely no lectures from either party on it. It has been there for me, I was born in an NHS hospital. My children were born in an NHS hospital. It's been there for me and my family, and this government has put record funding into it. Very black. <laughs> the, the Deputy Prime Minister, I thank him for his kind words, and we did join this place at the same time, and I'm pretty sure we'll be leaving at the same time. <laughs> that faces the health service across these aisles is workforce. And research shows that Brexit has worsened the UK's shortage of doctors. Yep. European nurses registering to work in the UK fell by 90% after the Brexit referendum. Wow. What more will it take for both him and the Labour Party to admit the damage that Brexit is causing our health services? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it all started off so nicely, Mr Speaker. But, um, <laughs> I don't know whether the Honourable Lady has actually been listening to what the Government has announced this week. We announced an additional £2.4 billion for our groundbreaking NHS workforce plan. That is the first time in the NHS's history that that has happened. And if you look at the record since this party came to power, almost 40,000 more doctors and more than 50,000 more nurses. Once again, the Conservative Party delivering for the NHS. Uh, tonight, at West Lindsay's uh, planning meeting, the RAF will apply for listed building consent to move the grave of Wing Commander Guy Gibson's dog. Apparently, the Home Office are quite content for 2,000 migrants to be cooped up next to 1,000 of my constituents living on, near the base, or actually on the base. But the RAF think it's intolerable that they should leave the grave of a dog who's lain in peace for 80 years. More importantly, will the Home Office start listening to us? If they insist on this proposal, will they put the illegal migrants at a discreet part of the base and let us get up, get on, with £300 million worth of levelling up a hundred buildings, many of them listed, a two-mile long runway, a spaceport, and let the dog lie in peace. <laughs> well, I think my, my honourable friend knows that we do have to take action to address the unacceptable cost 
of housing migrants in hotels. And I, I actually thank him for his constructive approach that he's taken to RAF Scampton playing a role in respect of that. Of course, Home Office ministers will have heard his broader representations, and I'm sure they will respond to him. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I, on behalf of my colleagues, extend our deep appreciation to all those past and present who continue to be dedicated to our NHS, including our staff in the health and social care system in Northern Ireland. Mr Speaker, in Northern Ireland, GPs, nurses, doctors and carers are adversely constrained by a lack of sufficient funding for our health service. The Northern Ireland Fiscal Council have highlighted that our allocation falls beneath need, which compounds the difficulty year on year. Can the Deputy Prime Minister assure me of the willingness of the Government to engage on this issue and to ensure that public services get what they need to continue delivering for the people of Northern Ireland? Uh, yes, I'm very happy to give the Right Honourable Gentleman that assurance. As he knows, it is actually the case that uh, the Department of Health in Northern Ireland has been allocated £7.3 billion, an increase of £20 million above 22-23. But of course it is the case that the, Northern, the absence of a Northern Ireland executive <laughs> is exacerbating the severe challenges that the healthcare service in Northern Ireland is already facing, and a fully functioning devolved government is the right way to deliver the necessary reforms needed for the Northern Ireland Health Service. Through. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Of the 16,700 cases of melanoma diagnosed in the UK every year, sadly over 2,000 will prove fatal. Regularly applying sunscreen is our most effective weapon against this deadly disease, yet the Treasury remains stubbornly opposed to exempting VAT on these life-saving products. As a melanoma survivor, and with a further heat wave expected later this month, will my right hand friend do everything in his power to remove VAT on high-factor sunscreen to save lives and to support the NHS as they celebrate their 75th anniversary? Yeah. Well, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise the dangers of melanoma. As a, as a fair-headed person with a fair-headed uh, family, where I'm acutely conscious of the need to wear sun cream, uh, I won't trespass onto Treasury decisions in this setting, but I know my right hon. Friend, the Chancellor, will have heard her representations. Mr Crawley. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, after 13 years of Tory government, this government's record is pretty dismal. Let's consider yeah, yeah. spiralling out of control inflation, interest rates set to hit 6.5% by the end of the year, energy prices double the rest of Europe, food shortages and strikes across the public sector and NHS, and graduates leaving university today with little, with mountains of debt and little to no prospect of home ownership. Yeah. Let me ask the Deputy Prime Minister, will he admit his Tory government's failure and urge the Prime Minister to call a general election now? Deputy Prime Minister. Well, rather than focusing on playing politics, we are actually delivering for the British people. I, I was. I listened to the Honourable Lady's litany. Uh, I was interested to note that her leader has been in power for 100 days. And what's their record been? Three failing First Ministers, two unfinished ferries, and a failed de deposit return scheme. I think we can all agree the people of Scotland deserve better. Yeah. Are they big for all? Hey, Mr Speaker, um, Conservative governments have a proud record of supporting the UK's steel industry. Yeah. And times in this house. But anyway, they're laughing, Mr Speaker, because steel production halved under Labour. I've many times in this house to talk about the importance of steel, not just to my hometown of Scunthorpe, but to our whole nation. So will my right honourable friend agree with me? We are always going to need steel in this country, and if we can't make it ourselves, we're going to have to ship it all from the other side of the world with all the emissions, environmental and ethical concerns that that will inevitably bring. Will he reaffirm today the government's commitment to making sure that we take further measures to ensure that we have a sustainable, long-term steelmaking production in this country? Well, I, I'm very happy to reaffirm this government's commitment to steel manufacturing, and I pay tribute to my honourable friend. I know what a champion she is for steel production in Scunthorpe, and long may she continue to do so. We have 
made meaningful offers of support to Tata and British Steel, and the Secretary of State recently visited Tata and British Steel to see firsthand the work underway. Jamie Stone. Mr Speaker, I am sure that the Deputy Prime Minister will be as pleased as I am that work is well underway to construct the Southern Spaceport. In fact, it is ahead of schedule. Recently, the North Coast Space Cluster has been developed involving enterprise agencies and companies. Does the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister agree with me that this can build massively on the uh, skills that have been built up for over many years at Dun Ray? And secondly, that the establishment of links, international links, with uh, possible companies in the United States can only be good news for the far north of Scotland? Yes, I completely agree with the Honourable Gentleman's uh, remarks. The development of this new spaceport is a key part of our ambition to grow the UK's space launch capabilities. And it is the fact that the first three years are expected to reach £20 million of investment, creating 40 jobs. And we are working with the United States, particularly through the Technology Safeguards Agreement, to allow UK companies to exchange technology uh, with the United States. Baron Bell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I associate myself with your comments about the NHS and pay tribute to all NHS workers, both in Newcastle under Lyme and across the country? And on that note, could I welcome the new long-term workforce plan, and in particular the extra 40% places for dental schools? Yeah. Uh, access to dentistry has been an issue for a number of my constituents. And would my right honourable friend consider the merits of actually opening new dental schools, not just new dental places? Keele University is one of the best medical schools in the country and would make an excellent site for a new dental school if that would be. Well, as ever, my honourable friend makes a very strong case for his constituency. Uh, as a result of the NHS long term workforce plan, uh, we are currently assessing capacity at existing dental schools to see whether they can accommodate the expansion in training places. But of course, we retain an open mind as to whether we need further such uh, education facilities. Give my bit up. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It was a pleasure to join colleagues from across the House this morning for the NHS 75th anniversary park run on this special day. However, my joy was short-lived when I returned to my office to find the usual array of emails from desperate constituents mm. who cannot get a doctor's appointment, a dentist's appointment, access to children's mental health services or proper care for their loved ones. Does he agree with me that, as today's report from three highly respected think tanks suggests, after a decade of underinvestment, our beloved health service faces either managed decline under the Tories or a Labour government with a radical new health and wellbeing strategy putting its back on its feet. Well, Mr Speaker, it may not surprise you to hear I don't agree with that characterisation. Actually, I'll tell you about this government's record on the NHS. Record funding, record doctors, record nurses, record scans, record operations. The only record from the party opposite is in Wales, where they now have the worst A&D waiting times in the country. The only other record is the length of the answers. Maybe we can speed up with Richard Drax. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with your comments about the NHS? My constituents in Weymouth and on Portland and I are getting a little tired of being told that placing a migrant barge in our port is in the national interest. It is not in the national interest, nor in ours. This barge, designed for 222, will accommodate 506 illegal migrants already testing our overstretched resources. It was imposed on us without any consultation. Many concerns, both on the barge and what the 506 young men will do going around a seaside resort at the height of the summer, unmonitored and with little money. Can my honourable friend stop this and ask my honourable friend, the Home Secretary, to do likewise? Well, I'm, I'm sure my honourable friend appreciates that we need to reduce the bill of housing asylum seekers in hotels and we need to look at different measures to accommodate them. Of course, I am very happy to engage uh, with the Honourable Gentleman, I'm sure the Home Secretary will do as well, to ensure that we can find a satisfactory solution in his constituency that protects his constituents' interests. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Last 
Last week, the coroner found that the cause of Luke Ashton's suicide in April 2021 was gambling disorder. Yeah. Immediately before his death, Luke, bombarded with inducements, placed over 1,200 bets. At no point did the operator intervene. From his previous brief, the, pre the Deputy Prime Minister will have extensive knowledge of the harm these inducements cause. So does he agree that the commitments to curb advertising and promotions in the Gambling White Paper do not go far enough yeah. to reduce harm and prevent more tragedies like Luke Ashton's suicide? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the uh, Honourable Lady will know from our conversations when I was Digital Secretary that I share her concerns about gambling inducements, and indeed I pay tribute to her for her campaigning on this issue. Uh, I think we have got a very good set of proposals in the gambling uh, white paper, and that sits alongside the 2019 NHS long-term plan, which committed to 15 specialist units across England to support those with gambling addiction by 2024. So I think we have good, good proposals in place. Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I draw the House's attention to the fact that we have the Chief Minister of His Majesty's Government of Gibraltar Yay. in the gallery, uh, Fabian Ricardo. Uh, can I seek an assurance from the Deputy Prime Minister that as the UK-EU negotiations with regard to the border between Gibraltar and Spain continue, that the sovereign, freely expressed opinions of the Gibraltarian people to remain British will be protected, yeah, yeah. as well as their security and economic interests? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to give my honourable friend and, indeed, the First Minister of Gibraltar exactly that assurance uh, this government will always stand up for the people of Gibraltar and their right to determine their own future. Yeah. Yeah. Gerald Jones. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Sarcomas are cancers that can affect any part of the body, inside or outside, including muscles, bones, tendons, blood vessels and fatty tissues. Sarcoma is rare. 15 people diagnosed every day in the UK, around 5,300 around the UK, including families in Merthyr Tidville and Rumney. Awareness is low, and as this is Sarcoma Awareness Week, could I ask the Deputy Prime Minister if he will meet with me and families affected so that we can discuss what more the Government can do uh, to raise awareness and vital funds for research going forward? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm very happy to, to give that commitment. I think probably best on behalf of health ministers. And indeed, uh, one of my colleagues in, in Downing Street, who was the Prime Minister's uh, PPS, sadly died of that disease. So I, I have a, a great awareness of it, and it's important that we continue to raise its profile. Paul Howell. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, last week, as an alumni of Durham University, I had the pleasure of going to the installation of Dr. Fiona Hill as the new Chancellor. Mm. Dr Hill, started in Bishop Auckland, couldn't afford a school uniform to go to the high school when she got a scholarship, finished up working in the White House and is an example of social mobility beyond yeah. it. That's what she's going to be championing as the new Chancellor. Could I ask him to encourage the Secretary of State for levelling up to work with me and the Left Behind Neighbourhoods APPG to do everything we can to support her? Yeah. Well, I, I join my honourable friend in relaying the government's congratulations to her, and I will ensure that the Secretary of State hears the representations that he made. Um, Mr Speaker, universities in Cardiff and indeed across the UK are home to world-leading research and innovation, but thousands of jobs and huge amounts of expertise are now at risk because of the government's dithering in negotiations over Horizon. The FT reported last week that Sir Paul Nurse, Nobel Laureate and head of the Francis Crick Institute, described the delays as absurd and damaging science and damaging the country. So is the government still committed to negotiating a deal? And if they are, why don't they get on with it? Yeah. Well, since we agreed the Windsor framework, we've had very constructive discussions on Horizon. But the difference between my party and his is that we won't accept a deal at any price. We will wait until we get the best deal for the British people and British universities. Yeah. Yeah. Bradley. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker. I am running a campaign at the moment, a year of reasons to visit the moorlands, where each week for a year I will focus on one of the many reasons to visit the moorlands, um, including we've had so far Hetty's Tea Room in Froggle, we've had Heaton House Farm Wedding Venue, we've had Brilliant Artists and Alton Towers, and this week is Leek Club Day. Can I invite my right honourable friend and you, Mr Speaker, to visit the Staffordshire Moorlands constituency to see one of the reasons for yourself? Yay! 
Well, I, I would be delighted to do so. I think maybe Ketty's Tea Room is more my cup of tea than Alton Towers, but I'm sure I can arrange a visit there. I think we'll both go on the big rides together. There we are. Chris Law. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I think everyone in this House can recognise that my city of Dundee is a city to be proud of. World-leading yeah. universities, pioneering businesses and the determined SNP City Council leading the way yeah. that is real ambition to deliver for the future. In order to continue our journey, the potential delivery of a world-class site by the Eden Project in our city will help cement our reputation and bring further investment, jobs and uh, boost our local economy. So can the Deputy Prime Minister therefore confirm that the UK Government will deliver on previous promises and finally commit to support capital funding for the Eden Project in my city? Yeah. 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 Well, I'm, I'm a very big supporter of the Eden Project, and I very much hope we can have one in Dundee. Of course, the United Kingdom government always stands ready to support people in Scotland and support people in Dundee. Thank you, Ford. Thank you, Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. Speaker. As the, uh, Mr. Speaker, as the, um, as, <laughs> as the child of two NHS doctors, the sister of an NHS doctor, and the wife of an NHS doctor, can I also say thank you to everyone who works in our yeah. NHS? Yeah. And will my right honourable friend send particular congratulations to the medical students from the new medical school at Anglia Luskin University in Chelmsford, who are graduating as doctors in a couple of weeks' time? It's the first time we've ever trained doctors in nice, Essex. Nice. It's been hugely successful. Will he meet with me to discuss doubling the size yeah. of our medical school? Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, I'm very happy to offer my sincere congratulations to those students. I know what a difficult course it is to qualify as a, as a doctor, so they thoroughly deserve their graduation ceremony. And, of course, health ministers will be very happy to meet with my honourable friend, my right honourable friend, to discuss uh, exactly those proposals. Ellen Hayes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent, who was a first-year university student, tragically took his own life in May. He had signed a private sector tenancy for his next year's accommodation with his parents as the guarantor. The tenancy includes a clause which states that the responsibilities of the guarantor are unaffected by the death of a tenant, oh, wow. and the lettings agency are disgracefully insisting on enforcing this abhorrent requirement. My constituents not only have to live with the devastating loss of their son, but also face terrible financial hardship because of this cruelty. Will the Deputy Prime Minister support my, cause, my call for the inclusion of a clause within the long overdue Renters Reform Bill to outlaw this practice and protect bereaved families? Well, what, what the Honourable uh, Lady described sounds totally abhorrent, and I'm very much very happy to look into the details of it and discuss what measures might be brought forward to address it. John Barron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At a time of record employment, an unemployment rate nearly half that of the EU average and strong inward investment. Can you explain, perhaps, my, uh, why every single Labour government since the Second World War has ended in economic failure, with sterling weaker and unemployment usually higher? Yeah. Well, my honourable friend is, is totally right. I, I might add to it that they also spend every last penny in the Treasury and I well remember when we entered government the note saying there was no money left. We should never allow that to happen to the British people again. The Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our um, absentee Prime Minister didn't turn up to the Owen Paterson vote. He didn't turn up to the Boris Johnson vote. He won't stand up to the MPs who called the Privileges Committee a kangaroo court. And yesterday, he embarrassed himself by acting like a, a stroppy schoolboy uh, in front of the Liaison Committee. Now, with NHS waiting lists at record high and the Tory mortgage, Tory mortgage penalty hitting my constituents hard, he's bitten off more than he can chew, hasn't he? Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there was a, a question in that. Uh, well, I might respectfully say, Mr. Speaker, is a, is a, a rant. Um, I, I would proudly defend this government's record, both in growing the economy in the last two years, 
faster than any other country in the G7, record low levels of unemployment, fewer people in workless households, all of which would be put at risk if the party opposite ever entered power. That completes Prime Deputy Prime Minister's questions. Just like the Chamber, please. Sorry. Uh, well, let's uh, just pause there as we come towards the end of Prime Minister's questions. Uh, this week with the deputies, Oliver Dowden and Angela Rayner, uh, both taking to the dispatch box. Our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, is with me. And Sam, we'll, we'll talk about Prime Minister's questions in a moment. But whilst they've been talking, there's been a, a development on an interesting story. And this is from uh, Andrew Griffith, uh, MP, who's the Economic Secretary to the Treasury and City Minister. He's been tweeting about bank accounts. Tell me what he's said and why is this relevant? So this is a story that's bubbling for the last few days. And actually what it's thrown up is really quite interesting. It began with Nigel Farage, uh, the former UKIP leader, uh, TV host, uh, complaining that his bank accounts were being shut down because he's something that's known as a politically exposed person. Now, that often means that banks will ask you for more information, but also in some cases appears to mean that banks shut down your credit facilities, your credit cards, all that kind of stuff, even though that's not what the original intention was. Now, we have Nigel Farage's account of why his uh, accounts were shut down. He's suggesting it's because of his political views. Uh, banks are sort of reluctant to go on the record about exactly why they're doing what they're doing, so we don't have the other, the other side of that. But park that for a moment, because what, what's happened in the last few days, which is really fascinating, is that all sorts of other people have come forward and said, well, that's happened to us, or that happened to my family. One of the most notable cases was Ed Vasey, former culture secretary now uh, in the laws. He was saying, look, my mother gambles. As a result of her being asked for her casino winnings, they started to threaten all my bank accounts and said that I, all my... I had a credit card um, that was cancelled and, and my account started to be warned that they could be shut down too because having uh, any kind of affinity with gambling made you a politically exposed per uh, uh, person. So that's the background. The government have taken quite strong note of all of this. There was some briefing over the weekend uh, uh, by the Treasury about their concern about this, and it's resulted in a letter now um, from the uh, Treasury Minister, Andrew Griffith, uh, to uh, Nicol Rathi, who is the managing director of the Financial Conduct Authority. And, it, and in essence, this says, uh, we have recently passed legislation uh, calling for a review into uh, the guidance of what's known as politically exposed persons, the uh, kind of status that's causing all these problems. And they're saying, look, we want you to look at this. We want to look at it seriously. Um, we're looking for easy wins, in the words of Andrew Griffith, uh, along the way uh, that we could implement, uh, so that we can implement changes expeditiously, i.e. quickly. Uh, so in essence, the government have hopped on the back of this issue after hearing, you know, there's a, effectively a cross-party campaign. This isn't about Nigel Farage. It's about the problems that many, many people are having uh, coming forward and, and they felt basically powerless and voiceless and, and without any recourse to appeal. Now the government are noting their concerns, are trying to take action and for some of those who feel aggrieved, hopefully there will be some changes in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and briefly to Prime Minister's questions, um, quite a lot of to and froing, uh, a lot of jibing, but, but anything particularly exciting that you heard? N not especially. <laughs> um, uh, look, I think it was actually quite smooth. Oliver Dowd was quite good at this stuff. He prepared Prime Ministers for years to do Prime Minister's questions. He is, he is, he's a sort of, good, I'm no cricket, he's a sort of dead, what is it, dead batting or whatever it's called. He just, it hits the bat, it goes down, it doesn't really go anywhere, but, 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 but he's not bowled out. Um, and that time and again, Angela Rayner entertaining. She went on mortgages, as we predicted, mm. uh, uh, and there were tributes to the NHS. I, I, I suppose what I'd say about it, it you know, it was, a, it was a sort of score draw. You know, the world didn't move in that Prime Minister's questions, but it really reinforced the fact that when the Prime Minister's not there and therefore the leader of the opposition automatically isn't there, it's just lower stakes. Mm -hmm. It's lower stakes, that the, the answers matter less. There were interesting questions from some of the... Some, some of the MPs, but, 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 but having the Prime Minister there matters. And um, Richard Zunat isn't there because there is a, this rather weird, you know, service in remembrance of the NHS uh, over the road today. He's not there next week completely, legitimately because of NATO. He's actually the, the Prime Minister in the last kind of 40 years who hasn't been there uh, uh, th the most. There are perfectly good reasons why this happens, although you do wonder whether or not they can shuffle around some of the diary commitments well, to, yeah, be, to be these one, he, He's there. missed 19% of Prime Minister's questions, and the previous record was 12% around the time of, of, of John Major. And, and, and you Brown. saw him being quite defensive about this yesterday in front of the Liaison Committee. Next week, he's at the NATO summit. He was in an argument with Chris 
Bryant about whether or not he shouldn't uh, cancel NATO to be at PMQs and how that wouldn't be the right idea. And, you, you know, when, when prime ministers want to do something, often diary managers find a way to make sure that they do. I, I think it's not quite as binary as perhaps the rhetoric has thrown up. I'm expecting Downing Street to give us a list of, uh, a reminder of all the reasons why Rishi Sunak couldn't come to all of those many, uh, several prime minister questions. Uh, and of course, statistics aren't always helpful. Um, the person who comes out best in that list, Jane, is Liz Truss. But that's only because she did three prime minister's questions. OK. Not necessarily a brilliant record to be emulating. Uh, thanks very much. Right, let's take you across to SJ. We are, of course, today across all of Sky News, marking the 75th anniversary of the NHS. Uh, SJ is in hospital at West Middlesex. Yes, I am indeed, Jane. Thank you very much. The NHS turns 75 today. But on what is an historic day, three leading health challenges...